Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker today. It's uh, Angel David Nieves, is Professor of Africana Studies, History, Digital Humanities and English, and Director of Public Humanities at Northeastern University. He's the author and co-editor of two historical monographs, including An Architecture of Education, African American Women Design the New South, and We Shall Be, We Shall Independent Be, African American Placemaking and the Struggle to Claim Space in the United States. Uh, Dr. Nieves has also co-edited a new volume. We're all excited to see this. It's just out. Uh, a new volume in the Debates in Digital Humanities series, People, Practice, Power, Digital Humanities Outside the Center. Uh, Dr. Nieves' scholarship focuses on the intersections of race, gender, sexuality, and technology in the United States and South Africa, and is in the vanguard of digital history publications and experimental online publishing platforms. And so uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Nieves. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. I am going to share my screen. I want to thank Julian Chambliss and Scott French for inviting me today to present at the annual Zora Neale Hurston Festival of the Arts and Humanities. I'm especially humbled to be presenting here, even if virtually, and in such proximity to N.Y. Natiri, the Executive Director of the Association to Preserve the Eatonville Community, along with, his peer, with her peers in the historic and heritage preservation of African American sites across the U.S. and in the African diaspora. She has paved an incredible and lasting legacy that continues to bear its fruit in a social movement that today has transformed the work of a generation of preservation practitioners. Historic preservation is now squarely invested in the work of BIPOC communities and in the histories of those communities such as Eatonville that thrived in the face of segregation and racial violence during the era of Jim and Jane Crow. I hope to meet her in person someday, but the COVID pandemic has robbed me of yet another opportunity, but I hope that only for now and only for this year. I'm going to share this. I don't think my reply message to the generous invitation from Julian and Scott was more than one line and included yes and when in that order. With that in mind, I think it's important when the opportunity avails itself to acknowledge our foremothers, especially when they are close to our presence today. It is especially important work to preserve the legacy of our collective foremothers, especially someone as great as Zora Neale Hurston. As your first speaker or storyteller of the morning, and on this day in honor of Zora Neale Hurston, I'm presenting my talk, Afrofuturism Across the Diaspora, Critical Fabulations and Nation Making in the US and South Africa. This, this talk is going to be rather speculative, and here I'm going to borrow from Sadia Hartman's work on critical fabulation in that it will seek to fill certain silences in the archive with my own forms of historical inquiry informed by years of research and practice in the recovery of long silence, fractured and even erased planning and design histories. This is also a new reframing of my work as I embark on a period of more intense writing and analysis after some 18 plus years of research in South Africa. It is always difficult to say with too much certainty these days, but as far as I can tell, no one has yet looked critically at the ways in which student movements in the US and in South Africa, specifically during the 1970s, can be seen as sharing Afrofuturist sensibilities, especially those that shared networks that ran across and between the networks of Black power and Pan-Africanist activists, and to perhaps complicate this a little bit further, established findings that those transnational social movements were actually quite similar to the student activism we are now witnessing as forms between and among students taking shape around the Black Lives Matters movement, the Roads Must Fall movement, and many others. But there's a little perhaps about me and maybe a bit redundant after Scott's introduction that I should say, um, uh, being a professor of Africana studies, of history and digital humanities, and a director of public humanities as part of a department of culture, society, and global studies in a college of social sciences and humanities, 
that within a department of history and as someone who holds appointments in English and an affiliate in a school of public policy and urban affairs, I mention all of this, uh, these many positionalities and, and perhaps these many situatednesses uh, in particular to let you know a little bit about the intellectual and knowledge making communities that I see myself a part of because they also suggest to some a certain kind of intellectual tradition and for others a kind of particular commitment to social change for black and brown people who have experienced diaspora in particular ways. These experiences are not always by choice, but despite how that arrival in the diaspora has occurred, either by slave ship, by border crossing, and but despite how that arrival in the diaspora has actually happened, may have also resisted and have also flourished in the most subtle and in the most remarkable of ways. In the interest of full disclosure, as a queer man of color, I identify as both Afro-Latino or Latinx or Latine, I'm a storyteller. I tell stories about messy histories that may make the reader or you today, the listener uncomfortable, not because I want to see you shift nervously in your seats. If I could see most of you, I see a good portion of you, or to make you turn your Zoom cameras off in response, but because as a historian of color, when stories are told that make the public uncomfortable, they can possibly lead to the welcome outcome of change making. Zora herself is complicated. Some have even argued too messy, but we would all definitely agree she was a brilliant Harlem Renaissance scholar who despite what some have clearly misinterpreted about her position on school desegregation and separate communities, she was a pioneer in African-American folklore, traditional storytelling methods, and in cultural heritage preservation techniques when there was little regard for those kinds of documentary practices among anthropologists who research Black Southern lifeways and customs. As you may know, and as Scott mentioned, I've also written extensively about African-American women's school reformers in the 1890s, who in Virginia and South Carolina worked to build black normal and industrial schools. Much of my early work in that period also considers how those race women leveraged their connections with early black and Jewish architects of the latter part of the 19th century and their inroads with the robber barons of the day to help build and plan campus designs that were projects in nation making. Zora's work was very much about nation making. I frame Zora's anti-desegregation stance as one that even at the time by others, including W.E.B. Du Bois, Martin Luther King Jr., Franz Fanon and others was not without careful consideration. Elsewhere, those who were proponents such as faculty at historically black colleges and university espoused racial self-respect, self-help, and self-association. Zora's positionality on black schooling deserves a much more nuanced discussion. She was a graduate of Howard University and was one of the most influential writers of the period, a Renaissance that actually first began in Washington, DC in the living room salons of gay black faculty, including Elaine Locke and others who valued the protective and intellectual community that, community that came with these unique but separate spaces. I wanna flag this image of Zora as a student in your minds, being mentored and finding an early patron in someone such as Elaine Locke. In this sense, she was already working in the space of Afrofuturism, bringing past and present and future together in her written works, in her early ethnographic work beginning in the 1920s, and in her analyses of black life in Florida. Well, what you may ask is what is Afrofuturism and I don't mean to be having us uh, think in some kind of naive way and turn to the Wikipedia machine, but Wikipedia's definition, that it says it's a cultural aesthetic, quote, a cultural aesthetic philosophy of science and philosophy of history that explores the developing intersection of African diaspora culture with technology, end of quote. For some, the term Afrofuturism itself is believed to have been coined by Mark Derry in the early 1990s. Today, Afrofuturism is most commonly associated with science fiction, and here I'll interject that it is most famously on display and has been and gets talked a lot about in mainstream culture in the Marvel Universe film Black Panther, 
but you will find many other Afrofuturist exercises and explorations in genres, including fantasy, alternate history, and magical realism. And it's also an important part of the festival's exhibition, Afrofuturism in the Visual Realm, at the National Museum of Fine Arts, curated by one of our own conveners. We won't have to mention his name. Um, Julian Chambliss has argued elsewhere, quote, that the expansive nature of the Afrofuturism dialogue today means the effort to provide a fuller narrative must take multiple approaches. The engagement with a Black speculative past, present, and future in the context of Afrofuturism opens the door to meaning recovery of Black figures that contributed to Black speculative practice that we might not initially describe as Afrofuturists, end of quote. I agree with Chambliss that a Black speculative practice that hasn't been initially described as Afrofuturist should perhaps be considered, and as part of what I'm offering to you here today, is perhaps a bit more aligned with Tasha Womack's book, Afrofuturism, the World of Black Sci-Fi and Fantasy Culture, that offers, quote, a highly intersectional way of looking at possible futures or alternate realities through a Black cultural lens. For her, it is a nonlinear, fluid, and feminist. It uses the Black imagination to consider mysticism, metaphysics, identity, and liberation. And despite offering Black folks a way to see ourselves in a better future, Afrofuturism blends the future, the past, and the present." End of quote. Zora herself was both a student of Black Floridian lifeways who was also contemplating her own sort of Afrofuturist framework that did not rely on whites, retained Black financial independence, and shaped pathways beyond the racial hatred and violence that was used to control any signs of Black self-reliance and advancement. I want us to speculate, speculate here a bit, even for my short time here, that for Zora, students were in fact the way to any broad social movement to affect change. How could this not have been the case given her strong 1955 statement in the Sentinel. In her letter to the editor in 1955, Zora writes, and I quote, how much satisfaction can I get from a court order for somebody to associate with me who does not wish me near them? If there are not adequate Negro schools in Florida, and there is some residual, some inherent and unchangeable quality in white schools, impossible to duplicate anywhere else, then I am the first to insist that Negro children of Florida be allowed to share this boon. But if there are adequate Negro schools and prepared instructors and instructions, then there is nothing different except the presence of white people. Negro schools in the state are in very good shape and on the improve. The Supreme Court would have pleased me more if they had concerned themselves about enforcing the compulsory education provisions for Negroes in the South as is done for white children, end of quote. Is Zora's position about providing black children with anything less than white children? Or is her position that nothing can be learned of value for black children from white children who will clearly not wish me near them? Hurston felt that the Supreme Court's decision only perpetuated a long held myth of the progressive empire that disguises colonial oppression in humanitarian and liberal gestures all of which Hurston was cleanly made aware with the collapse of radical reconstruction and its impact on her family and across Eatonville, I would argue. She is, I would say, making claims to a futurity that is all black and retains its cultural norms without compromising on quality or access to equally shared resources. And I'm happy to have us talk about that during the Q&A. Womack continues, quote, to me, a tenant of Afrofuturism deals with black people being told they must adhere to divisions which don't exist and only accept a limited number of stories about ourselves, such that we have an extremely limited concept of what material reality can be. Racism can give black Americans the impression that in the past we were only slaves who did not rebel, that in the present we are a passive people beaten by police who cannot fight back, and in that future we simply do not exist." End of quote. Second, I'm going to ask you to consider the following from not so distant past elsewhere in the African diaspora, a place that was also shaped by a student movement. On the morning of 16 
June 1976, Black African students were gunned down by members of the South African police and security forces as they marched to protest the adoption of, the Afrika of Afrikaans as the primary language of instruction for schools across Johannesburg's South African townships, Southwestern townships, better known, sorry, to the public as Soweto. The subsequent release of Sam and Zima's photograph, iconic photograph seen here, depicting the death of Hector Peterson, an early casualty of the protest, coupled with the death that day of tens of others of school children, would catalyze the student uprisings and spark the global anti-apartheid movement. The physical backdrop to these events, a so-called model native township, was made up of a series of systematically planned would-be South African garden cities with the primary purpose of reinforcing the powers and capacities of the state system of apartheid. My research in particular examines the microgeography of resistance and the layering of meaning and action between the apartheid state and township residents across its built form. Some of my early hypotheses regarding the influence of the Garden City movement suggest that the densities resulting from these planned interventions might likely have encouraged emp empowerment among its residents. Soweto, over nine, 18 miles southwest of Johannesburg CBD at more than 77 square miles and today with over 1.2 million residents at about 15.5 thousand persons per square mile, almost twice the density of Los Angeles and approaching the density of San Francisco is the most metropolitan township in the nation. The indigenous black population specifically in Johannesburg which have been widely dispersed and even landless before arriving in this newly emerging megacity, could organize politically and culturally here in Soweto in ways that permitted them to enact forms of resistance to the apartheid national city. In some ways, I argue that what they were actually doing was resisting a white futurist city that the apartheid nation was beginning to build for them. City officials, health reformers, and nationalist party leaders had envisioned townships, what I have called and referred to as black labor machines, as icons for progressive modern planning principles for the betterment of natives, yet over time, it inadvertently provided the network of densely organized communities that eventually ended up upending a system of domination and oppression. Segregation was nothing new, of course, in South Africa. Racial segregation was already in practice as far back as the white settlers who were permanently landing at what is now Cape Town in 1652. Entrenched structural segregation came about after the 1850s and is often attributed to the growth in racialism among the dominant classes of the British Empire and the age of imperialism. The indigenous back population was lured or forcibly moved from rural areas using tactics common to colonialism, including disposition of farmland, the expropriation of livestock, periodic war, and many other forms of manipulation to address the needs of rapid industrialization and the expansion of cities. Urban segregation of the African population was enforced under the Native Urban Areas Act of 1923, which established the settler doctrine that, quote, the town is a European area in which there is no place for the redundant native, end of quote. The Urban Areas Act begins to establish a series of legislative tactics that work to eventually build a white futurist South Africa, made possible only if and when the native problem could be solved. Other legislative acts and government policy mandates that required Black South Africans or Black Africans, colored or mixed race, and Indians to live separately included the Land Act of 1913, the Native Urban Areas Consolidation Act of 1945, the Immorality Amendment Act of 1950, and the Group Areas Act of 1950. By 1950, well over 40 acts and amendments were passed to secure the National Party's formal control over the urban landscape and its growing urban population. If we think about this, with those over 40 acts and amendments, they essentially were securing the parameters for this white nationalist, this white futurist city. However, these acts also ensured that over the course of several generations, the majority of the Black population would develop long-standing ties to and a rich cultural heritage of resistance within those spaces, their respective townships as the struggle against apartheid was waged. 
responses to the range of legislative acts varied widely, the but the most common was a frustration among activists that their voices remained unheard. South African industrialization had brought with it crime, disease, degradation, and prostitution, all of which were seen as incompatible with an emerging civic order for whites. Local municipal authorities sought new ways to address the problem of residential segregation in town planning developments. Ebenezer Howard's Garden Cities of Tomorrow, released in 1902, would provide a template for solving the crisis of the industrial city through the design of ideal towns built as separate satellites away from the parent city and surrounded by agricultural belts on land held in the, in the common by the community. Howard's proposal was determined to be a viable solution to the urban crisis across South Africa by employing town planning with layouts at relatively low density, although so Soweto today is slightly denser than Greater London. Ample gardens for allotments for open space, voluntary cooperation between landowners and local authorities, and self-management by residents. Here you're seeing an image of what this idealized garden city would look like. And this, in fact, was a propaganda photo that was completely staged on the part of uh, housers who were trying to promote this idealized vision. By 1922, the Joint Native Townships and Housing Estates Committee of Cape Town gave a contract for the preparation of an ta African township, which, quote, had been designed using the best examples of modern town planning, end of quote. In Johannesburg, the Western Native Township, along with the housing scheme near Langa in Cape Town, were among the first to incorporate low-density housing development using town planning principles in the design of garden cities. Both schemes incorporated a buffer zone to separate the African townships from white residential and commercial areas. Garden city design models were intended to veil the strong impulses of government-sponsored social control and racial segregation, or government-sponsored architectural project of social control and racial segregation. Many of the design intentions of the garden city movement in South Africa were undermined by the lack of available public funding or even private support for mining interests. Indeed, Soweto today, comprising itself of 29 townships, demonstrates attributes of a planned community and more specifically, a series of segregated planned communities. The 1927 amendment of the Native Urban Areas Act uh, allowed the uh, government to relocate people without first providing them with alternative accommodation and without paying attention to the growing need for more housing. City government provided emergency camps with basic water and sanitary services. However, in the early years, planning of what would become Soweto was rudimentary. It was little more than an improvised civil engineering exercise of lot and block plans, along with shocking sanitary conditions. There were no provisions for utilities, nor was there really model housing. Options including municipality built V-shaped huts, but no adequate alternative housing. The Orlando housing plan for African workers often consisted of two or three rooms with no kitchens or bathrooms. However, publications in South Africa of the time were replete with images of the ideal living conditions being provided for native workers. Residents of what would become Soweto were tenants and not landowners and were responsible for the development and maintenance of their own housing. They were unable to engage with planners, architects, or other design professionals for a whole host of reasons. So they resorted to subsistence strategies to erect better shelter, however temporary. These plans for housing Black South Africans were carefully circumscribed spaces that the apartheid state helped plan, design, and build as part of their white futurist model housing schemes to control Black and Brown South Africans. Subaltered urbanism, the study of post-colonial and post-imperial cities of the developing world has now emerged as a means to further theorize the global South's megacities and the subaltern spaces and classes, the spaces and classes conventionally perceived as inferior because of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, or religion that constitute a majority of their populations. The informal settlements of the 21st century that today command much of our scholarly attention in the fields of urban and regional planning are in many ways very similar to the settlements in cities such as Johannesburg at the turn of the 21st. The creation expansion of all black townships as a series of iconic planned urban would-be greenbelt communities have received only sporadic attention in the post-apartheid era. 
in lieu of a more common neoliberal view of the anti-homogenous symbolic and material meaning of the global megacity. For some, Johannesburg exemplifies the characteristics of an African megacity due to its post-colonial pan-African dynamics, which emphasize diversity, hybridity, and transformational processes of cultural exchange. The apartheid system that demanded an orderliness and a stringent urban management style focused on functionality has resulted in a certain level of neglect concerning the future of township growth and change, particularly in terms of preservation planning and policy. According to some studies, townships currently house more than 40% of South Africa's urban population and 20% live in informal settlements and low-income housing estates. In Johannesburg, 43% of residents live in Soweto, and a total of 73% live in townships, informal areas, and low-cost housing estates. A quarter of South Africa's population, 11.6 million, and now upwards of 47.8 million people live in the country's 76 largest townships. Because of historic social compression in racially segregated areas, older townships are seen as socially, culturally, and economically more diverse, often containing middle and lower income areas and scattered middle income households. So Weto provides an example of this sort of diversity of socioeconomic profiles. It begs the question, can a planning process that looks to Afrofuturist planning models provide solutions? Images and other documentation of early Soweto remain largely out of circulation as Soweto's bibliography and heritage continue to remain unexplored, all part of an untold countrywide narrative of township development. For example, the Visitor Center for Greater Soweto, a likely showcase for tourists seeking to acquaint themselves with Soweto's narrative is not in Orlando West, the most heavily trafficked tourist district of the townships and home to two Nobel laureates, now have since passed, Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu, but is instead located in Clip Town at the Walter Susulu Square. The narrative provided at that visitor center says little about the broader history of Soweto, except for a very brief mention on their website that Clip Town, quote, is the oldest residential district of Soweto and was first laid out in 1891 on land which formed part of Kip's Flute Farm, end of quote while the Cliptown Open Air Museum uses multimedia to tell the story of the drafting of the Freedom Charter in 1955, it fails to convey Soweto's complex spatial history to the public. I should also say that the multimedia stories told in the Cliptown Open Air Museum are often not working or actually don't have the electricity to power the open, um, the open air museum's multimedia narratives. Annual events commemorating the student uprisings of 16 June 1976 also do not focus on the ways in which the everyday built environment of the townships contributed to local forms of resistance or even social control for that matter. Soweto is a garden city and a metropolitan area replete with suburban topologies. The original Soweto Garden City Plan has proved resilient and nimble in its adaptation to black life under freedom. Originally overwhelmingly residential, Soweto's plan made allowances for schools, commerce, and sport, and over the decades, Soweto has accommodated such large-scale interventions as Orlando Stadium, where the 2010 FIFA World Cup was run, and also a brand new, semi-new Mapanyum shopping mall. Soweto is no longer strictly a bedroom community. It's an example where mass employment centers have grown and that the local economy hosts both formal and informal activities. Heritage and other tourist offerings include Black-owned bus tours, local restaurants, local arts and crafts found in stands, and at local retail storefronts. So over the past 12 years, Soweto has undergone major renewal and development. Today, Soweto is witnessing upgrades to its local social and economic infrastructure with additional investments coming from the private sector and from state entities such as the city of Johannesburg. Urban renewal and redevelopment have in turn led to an increase in, prop in property prices in the Soweto residential market, although COVID has also had a huge impact. There's an influx of higher income earners or what recent research identifies as an emerging black middle class. Soweto has also experienced an influx of wealthier residents 
and an outmigration of original residents of suburbs across Johannesburg begin to reflect the demographic changes brought on by the emerging black middle class. In the past, the outmigration of residents has been linked to the search for a better life and a greater number of amenities found only in the suburbs. However, as townships now have amenities similar to the suburbs, wealthier residents are actually moving back to Soweto. So while Soweto was intended as little more than containment housing, or more generously as a bedroom community, amenities and multi-use set-asides have developed. Amenities at Soweto have included parks, playfields, and these commercial districts, the Houghton commuter train, and access to the international airport have all developed. Highways to and around Soweto have also been expanded, but for the most part, public transportation, such as bus or taxi, remains still the most preferred choice of, uh, of travel. However, distances into the city are still considerable with at least almost 20 miles outside of the city center and a one-way trip into the city during rush hour may take as long as an hour. With white flight from Johannesburg into the suburbs, Soweto service workers are still now similarly dispersed from outside the city center. Bus networks from Soweto to Joburg suburbs have grown to accommodate this urban sprawl. 87 formal taxi ranks and a further 50 informal taxi ranks were identified uh, in Soweto in 1990. And we can also say that there's been a huge impact by the growth of uh, services like Uber. Because of the structure of the route system, passengers living in the western part of Soweto usually have to use two taxis to get into town. And in a typical weekday, some 4,000 taxis with passengers arrive and some 2,000 taxis load with passengers leave one of the largest taxi ranks at Barawada Hospital daily. Many passengers arrive by taxi from various parts of Soweto and transfer to buses leading for destinations in Johannesburg. So under the national government, uh, under apartheid, there were huge buses that often uh, helped to facilitate uh, travel because of the spatial reorganization of urban areas and the need to have um, uh, em employment uh, for Black South Africans in urban centers. So while the state has been upgrading infrastructure, local organizations have been continuing to pressure for basic improvements. And so we've seen that um, unemployment still is a particular challenge. So for undocumented arrivals from surrounding towns and farmlands and from those countries nearby, particularly from Zimbabwe, the dream of a better life often fails to materialize. The city of Johannesburg has introduced a number of new urban renewal initiatives, um, including the upgrading of Vilakazi Street, um, and also with the improvements brought on by the World Cup, also the improvements brought on to the Kip Town um, Sisulu Square dedication, but there are other challenges. The adoption of neoliberal planning policies over the past two decades has led to local and regional governments across the global south clamoring to become part of the world economy and to be designated as global cities, and Johannesburg is no exception. Although the city of Johannesburg spearheaded these redevelopment efforts, other partners, including the national government, Hauteng Province, and the private sector, have all poured additional resources toward the redevelopment of Soweto. So what this means for the major tourist attraction of Soweto Township is still at a considerable distance from the central business district and it still remains particularly unclear. In 2012, the Department of Arts, Culture and uh, Arts and Culture forecast the 100th anniversary of the African National Congress as a way to promote, quote, a forward thrust in our efforts to identify, collect, protect, and promote our heritage to deepen social cohesion and nation building and to serve as a both catalyst and driver of sustained development. For them, urban regeneration or third wave gentrification as seed in Soweto has meant the creation of even greater contrast between the haves and have nots and between the old and new residents. I would argue that perhaps understanding uh, the National Congress as a progenitor or actually one of the early uh, advocates of an Afrofuturism might be another way of understanding and contributing to a new way of interpreting the work of the African National Congress. Traditionally, some economists even argued that the institutional agents and the influx of capital are the key role players in the gentrification process, perhaps maybe even thinking differently about 
how we look at and examine gentrification might be another way of bringing new ways of looking at these processes. However, in the case of Soweto's urban regeneration, the spending and investment of foreign tourism seems to act only as an occasional or short-term fix. Uh, and the, because these monies do not necessarily become reinvested in new modern housing schemes or even as long-term catalysts for heritage development. And we've seen that many of the urban regeneration schemes uh, in Cliptown at the Red Location Museum in Port Elizabeth in, East, in the Eastern Cape have made very little differences in efforts to preserve historic narratives, historic fabric, historic structures, or even to redefine the parameters of what main significance, what it actually means for Black South Africans, and in most cases, do little to advance a serious Afrofuturist sensibility. So if we look at the work of historian Susan Craig, whose work on industrial heritage, we might provide a new way of conceptualizing the neglected history of those plant communities for workers as worthy of further studying uh, new ways of conceptualizing cultural value and significance. In a city such as Johannesburg, industrial heritage should be recognized as having cultural value and significance. And if we examine National Heritage Resources Act of 1999, the measures of cultural significance are aesthetic, architectural, historical, scientific, social, spiritual, linguistic, or technological. The act also promotes a more holistic approach to heritage management, where the physical site and its tangible material remains are meant to be coupled with the preservation of intangible heritage, which can be connected with a history and culture of African and other marginalized communities living in townships. The conservation of industrial heritage is certainly not only about buildings, oral histories, which often help us to reclaim invisible and neglected voices, provides an incredibly important dimension to such work. According to the National Heritage Resources Act of 1999, the association of a person or particular communities or communities with a place is a measure of cultural significance. It is also not only about individual buildings. The act recognizes that heritage significance resides in the whole, the precinct, its landscape, as well as in the parts, its buildings. An image like this suggests to us different ways of thinking about how an entire landscape begins to tell us a different kind of story, a different kind of narrative. So we can begin to think about a precinct or an entire heritage area gives us a different kind of notion of the significance of a place. The act in particular helps us to also understand how we can quote, assess the intrinsic comparative and contextual significance of a heritage resource, end of quote. So finding ways to ensure that the urban heritage resource is both worthy of preservation and also a means of generating income for local township residents through local tourism efforts is still very much debated. Uh, Sue Craig's work uh, helps us in, in how it also looks at Sophia Town. Quote, in some cases, working with industrial heritage allows us to foreground the many categories that the South African Heritage Resources Act provides of what uh, constitutes cultural significance and how it can be assessed. The history of industrialization and urbanization viewed through the lens of its physical remains shows how people, not only black people, had to adapt one of the many aspects of their identities, their culture to urban living, end of quote. Urban geographer Ronnie Donaldson has noted that since 1994, quote, a kaleidoscope of post-apartheid urban outcomes, including spaces of integration, redevelopment spaces, restitution and redistribution spaces, control spaces and spaces of decadence has been observed during the transition to democracy. And despite the new political order of concern for the well-being of the majority of the population, much of that concern has been marked by disappointment and in many cases, disillusionment, end of quote. Instead, many city policies put into place in the years immediately following the first democratic elections, and perhaps some would argue over the last 18 years across South African cities have focused on issues of densification, corridor development, and mixed land uses. Donaldson raises an important question. How are these practices, quote, or how will they be implemented in a sustainable manner that would take into consideration the conservation of historically significant areas? particularly as we attempt to understand the significance of township design and planning, and particularly 
township planning and design that was modified under the duress of the apartheid state in an effort to regain control of and to honor the kinds of changes brought on by the students who were actively resisting the apartheid state. So in other words, desegregating society, creating new infrastructure and building and redeveloping houses in interesting and new ways to redefine these white nationalist spaces into actually Afrofuturist examples, I would argue, for a new kind of South Africa. I'm almost done, sorry, folks. I'm gonna skip ahead. So I would argue, are there ways to harness perhaps some of these histories to preserve the memory of their successful resistance? Hence the question, should the culture of apartheid planning be conserved or should it be adapted and enveloped in some way that more closely benefits those living there? The question may be academic as Soweto is in every way in play from a development standpoint. Rather, one might ask, what material narratives are there left to preserve? And is there a way to mediate the objectives of either of the above? Today, most sites in Soweto that memorialize resistance to apartheid are connected to an individual person or hero of the movement, as it were. And yet the actual site of places like where Hector Peterson was shot, as you saw in Sam Noema's photograph on Moema Street in Orlando remains unmarked. Instead, the heritage tourism really marks the site of Villacazi Street where two Nobel laureates live and we do not get a sense of the broader social movement where students fought to resist the anti-apartheid, to sought to fight the apartheid movement. Instead, the Soweto Heritage Trust runs the Mandela House site, and that is now under the auspices of the city of Johannesburg. However, when the house site was administered by the Mandela family, contemporary photographs documenting shifting collections and artifacts of questionable provenance were demonstrated and were on that site and were actually not in fact celebrating the work of students and giving us a sense of that more complex kind of history. Ultimately, uh, we must perhaps think differently about these kinds of histories. So from Rose Must Fall movement in South Africa, we must begin to think for a more equitable Afrofuturist South Africa to the monument spaces, places and architecture where the material culture of a white futurism is re-examined disentangled or removed from racist origins. Students are reusing, remixing the confabulations of white made, white constructed spaces into aspirational spaces for Afrofuturist cities of liberation. I'm reminded of the passage of Zora Neale Hurston's From Their Eyes Were Watching God, where she vividly describes that idealized black space, black place as quote, the city of five lakes, three croquet courts, 300 brown skins, 300 good swimmers, plenty guavas, two schools, and no jailhouse. And so in closing today, I'm also recalling that place as we are now making witness to hopeful Afrofuturism playing out across the spaces of the African diaspora. Thank you. Angel, I bet you up here. Uh, Angel, I want to thank you so much for that excellent conversation. Um, uh, that that was really brilliant. I really appreciate it. I want to open the door to questions. I know that there probably are some in the room, um, but I just want to say I really appreciate the way that you identify the importance of diaspora and our understanding of Afrofuturism and wove together these sort of singular questions about black spaces, both in the American context and in South Africa to call attention to the nature of the built environment and the legacies of power associated with that. But I could like talk to you forever about this talk, but I know I'm supposed to ask people questions. Okay, here we have one. Say your name, sir, and what are your question? Dr. Nieves, my name is Walter Grayson from McAllister College in Minnesota. <laughs> it's good to see you, man. Good to see you. I don't want to give away to the whole room what this is all about, but I kind of do want to give everybody a foundation. Um, talk more about Soweto 360 and the importance of digital humanities work 
how the, the ways that you're reinventing what we can create as scholars fits into the history that you just presented for us. Sure, sure. Thanks for the question. Good to see you, Walter. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm jealous that you're all there um, in, in the warmth and, sh and sharing with each other's intellectual brilliance. Um, I'm missing out. Um, uh, part of the work that I didn't talk about, uh, and I, I decided to put, sort of put that aside and, and try to do some of the work that I don't often get to do and, and delve a little bit more into the intellectual uh, project, uh, is that I also uh, uh, do a lot of work in reconstructing the spaces that have been lost and erased by uh, the, the power of, of, of the apartheid state. And so, uh, I've been busily working for years on reconstructing these lost and erased places using 3D technologies and um, then building software and platforms to make that possible so that these stories can be told online uh, and, and working with community groups and uh, cultural heritage organizations to do that work. Um, more readily and more easily and more effectively. Um, we also, and, and I've been a little bit quiet um, about that uh, uh, also and more recently, um, we just uh, at Northeastern received a half million dollar planning grant to bring that work to the US and, and to begin that more effectively working with community groups here in the Boston area, but also to roll that out nationally. Uh, to begin to work uh, in ways to uh, train up uh, community archivists and, and to begin to tell those stories more, um, uh, more effectively at the grassroots level. So um, all my many years of doing this uh, internationally is now being brought back to the US <laughs> uh, and, and we're going to start that process and roll that out um, in more effective ways. So more news to come there, but uh, thank you for asking that question. Uh, I think maybe um, there was, there, you're a plant or something, uh, but uh, yes, uh, <laughs> uh, more to come. Thank you. We do have a question over here. Uh, hi, Angel. This is Bruce Jans here. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for that uh, great talk. I want to actually push you back maybe 20 years before your, your uh, 1970 own here. You mentioned in passing Safaya Town. And it just seems to me that it's such a great example of much of the what we're talking about. So I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit on Safaya Town as a kind of Afrofuturist uh, kind of space. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Bruce. Good to see you as well. Um... God, you're all there. Um, so so um, <clears throat> one of the uh, uh, things that, um, and, and, and there are a series of these communities, uh, for those of us who um, work in, in, um, uh, in South Africa and work in um, uh, these uh, communities that were uh, erased by the apartheid state, uh, Sophia Town was um, a mixed race community that to, was also destroyed um, in, in, in the 50s by uh, the apartheid state. And it uh, was a place that revealed uh, the power of what was possible when communities came together, um, but also uh, through Sue Krieg's work uh, reveals the power of what happens when uh, a community comes back together to tell the stories about uh, what a future uh, can be when uh, uh, relatives and descendants come, come to try to reclaim that 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 past, but also think about that future of what this place could uh, be. And so um, as a site, it, it has a kind of activation for not just uh, um, telling these past stories, but the potential of what those reclamations can tell us about the future. So, so it's really um, uh, another one of these sites that, I mean, there are a whole series of these sites that I think are just ripe for um, telling these kinds of stories. And we've been talking about uh, trying to do a, a summer study abroad program actually uh, that, that does these sort of uh, labs uh, across sites in South Africa. And so um, that's something we'd like to maybe partner up with, with some folks and maybe um, some of our Florida uh, colleagues would like to do that uh, with us. Uh, 
but there are some some fabulous opportunities with some of our colleagues in South Africa to do that that work uh, and and within the framework of um, Afrofuturism, I think that that would be a real um, way of moving some of those conversations forward and in a community engagement sort of modeled framework. Thank you. We have another question. Hi, thank you. Can I ask two questions, or am I limited to one? One only. Okay. <laughs> then I'll ask the most uh, the second question first. Uh, my name is Richard Reap, and I'm an architect, and I'm uh, fascinated by uh, Afrofuturism as a possible sort of movement forward in architecture. Um, I was very fortunate to work with um, NY on the Zora Neale Hurston Museum a couple of years ago. So my uh, second question <laughs> is. Are there any urban design movements that you see coming out of Soweto that might give some hope for a self-directed future that would replace this kind of um, Potemkin village that was handed to the population back in the 20s? Yeah, uh, great question. You know, there is, um, and I think one of the places that that um, uh, needs to be in these conversations and, and should be, and, and if, if there were any projects that were going to happen transnationally between institutions here in the US and, uh, in, Af in, and in South Africa, I think the University of Johannesburg is one of the places that we would, would which should be in conversation with, particularly um, there are School of Architecture um is is one of those places that has been really at the forefront and even their arts school um and and even some of their graduate programs in art history uh, are really um, quite cutting edge and experimental and are very much uh, modeled around this this very deeply embedded community engagement process sort of co-creation model so um i would say that that that's the, the places that we should be turning to for um doing this work um i'm not um yet really convinced there's been a little bit of a a kind of stark architect um Thing that has happened and gone on in South Africa that seems to always plague the field of architecture. And, um, and then I think it's a little bit of an empty promise uh, because they tend to pick up the star architect and, and then that um, doesn't last very long, unfortunately, um, because um, you know, they, they usually build the same thing over and over again. And, and I think one of the unique problems in South Africa has been that many of these um, model projects that have been built, um, there never is a long-term business plan put into place. And that's kind of a long range problem that happens when these showcase pieces get built. Uh, so, so I think there's gotta be a real ground up uh, local solution for, for how to sort of provide this. So an Afrofuturist model has got to be at the grassroots level um, and really working with local solutions in a sustainable way uh, that, that really looks to um, the local community for those solutions that are going to be uh, harnessing their particular skills, but also their particular life ways and their particular narratives and their particular um, functionalities, their particular tools and their particular um, um, materialities that, that that'll make it functional. And I think the Red Location Museum you should look up what is a particular example of something that was a architect model and now has been completely uh, destroyed by the local community because it was not built as part of a process uh, that engage the community and eventually um, it became this behemoth that uh, uh, went completely awry. So I'll leave that there. And it's something worth, um, I think everyone should look at as what not to have happen. Um, it's the worst case, um, what can happen in, in, um, in a museum model that should have been done differently. Got another question for you right here. We heard uh, Dr. Evans. Uh, for your comments, reference the work in Eatonville. And in fact, what I'd like to do is to draw your attention, bring your attention back 
literally back home uh, to uh, Eatonville is a place that is not in the past. We are we are looking to continue on. So the question that I have, the comments that you have made just a few minutes ago, to engage community uh, in terms of looking forward, um, we see Eatonville as a laboratory in, in some respects. So I would ask you to make comments about how, let's say, authenticity and uh, looking to the future, how those elements can combine in a practical way um, going forward in a place that is not gone, mm -hmm. uh, but a place that is uh, seeking to maintain its uh, the continuity of its uh, history and culture. Thank you for that. that uh, and, and that's one of the challenges I think that um, is is always uh, at the core of, of this kind of work where we're trying to capture not just a past, but a path forward. And in particular, um, what are the kinds of stories we want to keep telling, but also what the future holds. And I think it's about trying to make real um, how the communities have changed and where the communities are headed. And I think it's about telling generational stories uh, in ways that um, move us in new directions. Um, and I think marking the ways in which uh, change has happened and the new ebbs and flows of uh, how eth new ethnic communities have come in and um, have built uh, a new way forward on the legacies that are there. Uh, so that I think is, is one pathway to, to sort of capture those changes, but also moving uh, us forward uh, in, some, in some interesting ways. And, and that I think is, is something that um, is so exciting about what you've done in Eatonville, and and so, um, and that's one of the things I'm 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 most saddened by that I'm not able to see uh, by not being on the ground. Uh, so um, I I'd, I'd like to try to uh, uh, have that opportunity to see that um, more more in person, and and so I think being able to do a, a generational um, uh, study that that. Uh, brings together those narratives from not just the past, but also those communities that continue to sort of ebb and flow and move in uh, as a way to, to, to complicate that narrative is, is I think, um, and capture those new narratives as a way forward. Just a follow up, please. I know that we're running uh, close on time, uh, but I, I would um, ask you to consider uh, not only coming to Eatonville, our next five year cycle, uh, 2025 to 2029, we're looking at placemaking. All of the things that you've stated as generalizations, uh, I think really could uh, we're seeing that you would look at planning in terms of Eatonville as a possible model in the United States. We will, we will be communicating with each other. Well, on that note, I think we'll, we'll pause here and once again, thank Dr. Neves for his excellent talk. Uh, you, you, uh, again, I, I say I appreciate so much uh, your words and wisdom here today and a great way to start the conference, but do you want to keep on schedule? Someone's got to be the moderator, the, the sort of conductor. <laughs> and I know that that we would all love to spend more time with you, but I, I really de deeply appreciate it. And um, we are taking a break now. We'll sign off with, with, with Angel. Uh, we have a little bit break now, but then we'll be back at 1030.